I feel it's very true. I mean, more than true. I feel it's very accurate to the spirit of the book. I spoke to the producer of The Four Weddings and a Funeral, and I said, I've just read the most fantastic book, which would make such a great film. And he said, what is it? I said, The English Patient. Ah, oh, being done. <laughs> and that would be unconscionable, I suppose, wouldn't it? Do you feel any obligation? Supper. Where have you been? Rabbit hunting. To tell you the truth, when I heard they were going to make a movie of the novel, I was very excited, but I thought it was an impossibility. <laughs> Kiss me before I cut. Just in case. And then I read the script, I read the book, and I said yes. Hannah! What is this business with you and explosives? Do you think you're immune? When I'd finished it, I picked up the phone and called Saul's aunts and said, I found a book I want to make a film of. How many adventures are left? Uh, this is one of them, to come out here and with a crew and doing something that you know is going to be good. You don't know how good, but you know it's going to be good. Well, it's very strange to be here. I still sort of imagine everything in black and white, you know? It's sunny to see the red and the red cross was very exciting. I'm a child of film. I mean, I, I grew up with movies. I snuck out to movies whenever I could. I, you know, in any crisis, I went to a movie. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, that's very much part of my vocabulary. And, and at the same time, it's, um, I think the, the books seem to evoke film. I haven't read the book since I did the adaptation. I don't think I could. I, I brought it with me because I thought I would start to read it before I began shooting, and I read the first three or four pages and I had to put it down because it was terrifying. <laughs> it's so good, and also it's so different from where I am now. With the, I mean, the screenplay, I hope, it will take you back to the heart of the book without in, in any particular way mirroring the, the structure or, or, or um, uh, point of view of the book. The book began as, as I think, strange inquiry into this image I had of a man in a, in a plane uh, crashing in the desert. fully united through love and suffering, has a mystery at its core, the identity of its enigmatic catalyst, the English patient. And to capture the tone and spirit of the book was itself a constant and challenging adventure for both cast and crew. Here on the Venice Lido, a day of shooting begins with Italy's venerable Hotel des Bains, being transformed into Cairo's legendary shepherds of the 1930s. figures in themselves. I mean, um, each of the actors portraying the parts are so careful in creating their character, they probably know the body language more than I do. And um, if you're walking through this hotel lobby and you see, you know, members of a crowd, you, you sort of, okay, these are the minor characters in the story and these are the major characters. 
it is a kind of kind of externalizing of your brain in a way. Seeing it, you know, so the whole hotel is like a cast of thousands. I felt as if I was reading a document which, in some ways, was rather like reading somebody remembering a film they'd seen. It was so full of image, and, and it, it's much more like a record of a visual journey than it is a, a novel, in a way. Are we going to do another rehearsal? <laughs> <laughs> The director of photography, John Seal, surveys the scene from the dummy front of a Thomas Cook office as Michael Ondaatje patiently watches the setup. At the director's side, Saul Zantz, legendary producer of Amadeus, reviews each move and every detail before the cameras roll. Great book. I said, I really love this book. And two or three weeks later, he called me up and said, I can't get it out of my mind. I think there's a picture there, but I don't know how to do it. And, uh, I said, well, I'm going to read it again, and I read it, and I said, uh, I think there's a picture there, too, but I don't know how to do it either. We start with these boys and bring them down, or you start at the door, do you think, and bring her up? Yes, I would have thought, yeah, we sort of presented the hotel. So now we should be on them and just, up. just keep them rollicking so, along. So then they, she comes up, she's about where Carolyn is. Yeah. And then we move up with her. We let her go to that point, I think. Okay. And then go, only go back with her after. Right, OK. Most of them have read the book. And I think the funny thing is really that the way Anthony has written the script and got so close to the spirit of the book that a lot of scenes that seem to be essential scenes in the book, in fact, were scenes that he had invented. I mean, yesterday, someone said, thank God you kept the taxi scene in outside the hotel. And, you know, and so that wasn't even in the book. Delay them coming in, yep. so so I can open the door for her. Sure. Go back and come round, and they can. Yeah. Let Rafe open the door. Then you come in. Okay. See, there's she only has one small bag. Then you come around and meet Rafe. Time here. it so okay. you get the bag here. Okay. 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 Once more. Understand that? I just fell so madly in love with this character, with Catherine. Um, and through Catherine, so in love with El Marshi that it just, it just seemed so, you know, just had to do it. I really had to do it. I've never felt strongly like her, like that before. Never, 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 not to that degree. And I wrote to Anthony and persuaded him to meet me and all this sort of thing. And I knew I was up against some pretty stiff competition, but I just thought I've just got to give, I've just got to do all the things that I never normally do and, and um, hu humiliate myself and, and get the part. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Clifton, I'd like to present Count Zolmashi. Hello. Geoffrey gave me your monograph when I was reading up in the desert. Very impressive. Thank you. I wanted to meet the man who could write such a long paper with so few adjectives. <laughs> well, a thing is still a thing, no matter what you place in front of it. Big car, slow car, chauffeur-driven car. Broken car? Still a car. Not much use, though. Love? Romantic love, platonic love, filial love. Quite different things, surely. Uxoriousness, that's my favourite kind of love. Excessive love of one's wife. Now, there you have me. It's really completely different from the beginning and the end, right? OK. The beginning, like, sword, camel, yeah, then da, 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 then and then friendly. And then... and then, exactly. Working with Anthony is... It's very difficult to describe a relationship between a, an actor and and the director because it's, unless somebody is barking out orders and being completely impossible, you don't really notice the director because he should be sort of manipulating you in a way. I mean, some people hate the idea of being manipulated. I think it's great. Um, but in the, they should be able to sort of push you and shove you and kind of glide you into positions that you don't really, and if it works well, then you shouldn't really notice. And, and I think that's what's been happening. He's a very gentle but firm director. I mean, he's, he's maybe a bit the, the iron hand in the velvet glove. I mean, if you think it's all soft, you're often mistaken. Uh, you come up against quite a strong will there to make this film happen and to make it all, all gel and come together, which, of course, is very necessary in a, in a director. An emotional scene with Ray Fiennes and Kristen Scott Thomas exchanging a few words involves a complicated crane shot that takes an entire morning to shoot. 
you not come in? Uh, no. Please come in. Mrs. Clifton. Don't. I believe you still have my book. So what I did in the end was abandon the book in a particular way and leave it alone when I was doing the adaptation and try and start as if I were reimagining and reinventing what I thought was the journey of, of, of the film. And I obviously had Michael's navigational skills with me at various points, but it, the discipline for me was to try and find my way, write my way back into those people and, and what seemed to happen to them. And in the process, I'm sh sure I will have offended a lot of people and, and there's a lot of bloodshed and, uh, um, and, and some parts of the book were inevitably hostage to the process of compression that a film requires. I think I'd, I'm pretty less torn than the reader. I mean, you know, there's certain favorite books of mine that if I knew they were gonna make a film, I would want, I would want to have a lot of say in it as a reader. But as a writer, you don't, you know, I think the reader, because we are, we, sort of, we are sort of interpreting the material that the writer has given us, we have uh, very strong opinions about what uh, Dick Diver looks like in Tender is a Night, you know. And you know it's not so that's it's alone. So he's a, so I mean, all the, you know, so I, mean, I think the reader has, a, in fact, um, more to, to do with the, the physical look of the, the actor. And I feel that Michael's presence on, on the set is extremely constructive. And I feel that he's there giving complete, you know, um, moral support to the film. And of course, I, I love his book, so I wanted very much for him to feel that whatever choices any of us are making, interpretations that we're attempting, I wanted him to feel that they're, they're in the right direction um, and are in harmony with his original um, imagination. It's like, imagine that the world of the Shepherds ends on that top step and you are staying in it now. You can come back to the edge of the top step. Okay. Yeah, it's just very different now there are so many people because it's. They're not going to be so many people. Oh, there aren't. Yeah, because okay. we wouldn't be speaking with so many no, people like that. It's way too far away. Anthony is really happy to explore things on camera, which is great. It doesn't all happen in discussions. You know, it happens actually there in front of the camera, and that's what, what I love, because I love working with the camera. I love it. For the actors, the job of bringing just the right dramatic tone to their performance often involves hours of intensive rehearsal before the cameras roll. Choreographer Carolyn Choa works all afternoon with the stars so that their romantic foxtrot moment in the upcoming ballroom scene will look like second nature. I'm trying to do something small but intense in the way they dance together to show one that they are very natural with each other as if they've danced all their lives together, although this is the first time they dance. And also to try and use the formality of the dance at the time to charge the space between them with an intensity. And the foxtrot, I think, particularly lends itself to, to this kind of thing. It's, it's, um, it's a sexier dance than we know, I think. <laughs> I've been kind of like going like train over here as much as I can. Yeah, yeah, just do some just conversation. Well, then, then don't do it. Because you shouldn't have to think about anything at all. That, you know, like, you shouldn't have like to. Have to, I, come to. I do like, you're doing it already. Mm. I do like it that there's a very pronounced uh, stepping into between her legs there. Dun, dun, bum, bum. There, yeah. Da, da, da. 
great. Do you want to do it again? Yeah. Yep. One of the love stories unfolds here in the Tuscany hills of Italy. Against this lyrical backdrop, Juliette Binoche's character, Hannah, a Canadian nurse who abandons her medical unit to care for the burnt English patient, falls in love with Kip, an Indian sapper and bomb disposal expert. To film the war scenes, the 200-strong production army, made up of Italian, English, American, and Australian crews, set up their own base camp here for several weeks. This film is it's about two very different situations. It's about North Africa before the war and Italy at the end of the war. And one obligation for all of us is, is to draw the biggest contrast, to sort of polarize those two images. So you, it's not a question of sort of finding locations, finding beautiful tones and images in any uh, kind of loose way. Everyone is in juxtaposition with something else, and often in our case, in, in direct contrast to something else. So what conditions what you do is that objective of sort of polarizing them, drawing the biggest contrast, really. I've elected to pursue a very straightforward uh, and, and perhaps rather mundane way of distinguishing time and place. I've insisted that we, in terms of colour, in terms of quality of light, in terms of the way we shoot, that we make a very clear distinction between Italy and, and, and the desert. And so I hope that as, a, as an audience member, you won't be constantly trying to, to reread, as it were, the last 10 scenes to work out where you are, because I think being confused is, a, is not a useful uh, um, activity in the cinema. At dawn in an olive grove, the crew sets up a scene involving Hannah trying to help an entrapped Kip to defuse a mine. Although it ended up on the cutting room floor, it provides an insight into the painstaking process of filmmaking, the metamorphosis of words on a page to a moment on film. Go to the left! Keep to your left. There are mines and trip wires everywhere. Get Hardy. He's on the other side of town, in the hills. Get him to Hardy. Okay, I'll help. Thanks. The mines, the wires, there's a trick. Some explode if you stretch the wires, some if you cut them. What do I do? There's a mine here. I think I can see it. Hands blazed. Yeah, boy. 379, take one, A camera. B camera. A very complicated idea can come out just in one small gesture or one, even a look, you know. And if you have the right actor, that look can save you a page of dialogue. For me, it's the same feeling before a take. I never know how it's going to be, what's the emotions going to be, or the answer, or the listening. When, because when you listen to the other character, um, somebody's working with you or talking to you, you're, it, you have to have a, a fresh ear. And so it makes it new all the time, each time. Yeah. Don't get involved. She's not going to get involved. And don't take your eye off that foot for a second when you... It, it, it's only the tiniest glimpses at her. Because if you lose that concentration, you're dead. <laughs> Working with actors, what's important to know is that all actors require quite different handling, obviously, and, and help. And some actors are much more concerned about being left alone, given a space in which to operate, a defined space, and then essentially left to their own devices to find their way through. And the danger as a director is you bring a directing technique to bear on work, as if it, you can just be the same for everybody, whereas in fact, you'll find that other actors need to be, need great intervention, want to be very heavily directed, and, and, and the gradient to be found for them beat by beat by beat. And so the difficult thing always, particularly if you have actors from different disciplines and training, is to try and find a way in that serves the scene and also pays attention to every individual's needs. And here we have a, a situation where there's, the, the, the Naveen, I think, responds to very assertive and clear messages from me. And often, I'm probably, I'm not either assertive or clear, so that's what we're trying to, to sort out today. Just give me the line. Go, go, go to the left. Keep your left. There are mines and ship mines everywhere. Get Hardy from the other side down in the hills. Get into Hardy. It's OK, I'll help. No! Mettiamo la bandiera per la macchina, per cortesia. Right. Yeah. Shout at her. Just keep her away from here. Get away from here. Yeah. Chris, you hear that? Well, one second, Mark. And with Juliet, you have a different technique, because you seem to be very tender with her. And very... <laughs> you hold her hand. 
No, no, it was, J Juliet is so true as an actor and so transparent and needs the environment to be as, as authentic as possible. That's how she works. She works off of, if she's looking at a tree, there needs to be a tree there, and then she'll give you the best tree looking imaginable. If there's no tree there, she, she, doesn't, she doesn't actually generate her own imaginative world. When you provide her with the, the, the appropriate environment or the appropriate response, then she is perfect and extraordinary. So that's been my job, is to make sure there are trees in front of her when she's looking at trees. I love working with Anthony. I think he's one of the best directors I've ever worked. The atmosphere and, and, and the great concentration and, and, and love that goes through, you know, all the people. Um, but I don't know, I feel at home on this set, you know? Anthony does cherish us as actors. He does seem to care, you know, and that's very rare. And he is a writer, but uh, he can direct. You know, you have to have a hardness or a kind of coldness, a distance from your own material, I suppose. I, mean, I don't know what it must be like. I have neither the breadth of vision or the inclination to do something like that. It must be very difficult, but he can do it, you know? <laughs> now cut this one. You must get away before I cut. I'm not cutting if you're still here. Anyway, you can't cut, can you? You'll fall over. Where's the pliers? Yes, just here. Oh. Kiss me before I cut. Just in case. Now, let's talk about that kiss. It's very, very important this kiss. It's a kiss of absolute innocence. It's a kiss of discovery. You know, it's not sexual, and it's not... It's a, it's a difficult thing to do. Because of the physical effort. Of... Physical effort, but it's also never... It wouldn't be sexual between you, because you don't... You haven't... It's so... It's A, it's completely inappropriate at this point because you've got to, you know, you're an inch away from, from maybe dying. But it also mustn't be a, a kiss of, you know, pursed lips. It's got to be a, a, a kiss which is, in another, another circumstance, would be extraordinary and, a big, you know, a prelude. It may be a prelude to dying because of this about to cut. If there's a grid between uh, a, a, a frigid kiss and a, the, the kiss of uh, two people about to make love, this kiss is on the innocent side. That's all. I mean, we just, we just need to find it. Yeah. Kiss me before I cut, just in case. But it's a very important one. It's a, it's, it's a, a magic kiss because it's a second <clears throat> before a possible death. It's also a kiss that's been coming for a long time in the film between you. And we just have to place it really well. Kiss me before I cut, just in case. It worked! We're almost in position now, Steve. I'm gonna go back to my uh, firing position and I'll give you a shout when we're there. If we can time it, we'll start the zoom just before the jeep moves. Once the jeep moves, you're tracking the whole time. Yes. And then when it blows up, wait a beat or two after it blows up in the air. When it hits the ground, just stop it. Just stop the zoom. Okay. Okay. It's a difficult film, logistically. There are big moves. I mean, not just from Italy to, to Tunisia, North Africa, but moves within Italy. We shoot in Rome, in the studio, Rome in the town, uh, here in Tuscany, in two or three different places, um, to Venice, to town and desert in Tunisia. It's a big... I mean, we are literally an army on the move, and it's logistically complicated, so that's demanding. When you design a set in the studio, then obviously just by your placing of windows, doorways, furniture, you, you condition the shooting. You, you actually sort of block the scene um, in a way that doesn't have to be acknowledged, really, but you do. You have that... Con in a location, that's more difficult, of course, because things are not always where you would choose them to be. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, a, you know, it's... You, 
on location shooting, the designer ends up disappointed, perhaps more often, slightly more often, than, than on, a, on a set that he's designed and controlled. Action on the convoy, action on the convoy. Today, it's the intricacies of a Jeep explosion, a pivotal moment in the story that preoccupies the stunt and special effects crew. Don't, I'm telling you what I want. I want the, him to be here. That's why our camera is here, because this is the best place to be. Not back, here. Attention, here the explosion, and the track is stop after five, six minutes. That's fine. It's, no, it's okay. The, that's why the camera's here. No, not no, six no, feet above, no, not six feet, but, but we're confusing no. this guy. I don't want him to be confused. No, I want him to understand this one thing, which is this is the place to be when the bomb goes off. Okay. Now this time we're 40 feet too far back. We're dropping a vehicle out. Yes. If he goes too far, he should slow down and try and stop as close as possible. Okay. His job is so to understand that we want to be here in this when the bomb goes off. Wind up with that camera. Here we are with a multinational, multilingual crew, and there's some irony in that we have, you know, all kinds of difficulties which are motion people are simply not understanding what, what is being said to them or what or not being understood. So there are some... some uh, there are some reflections of the issues of the book in the way we're making the film. But the, you know, Steve, one thing that's important is that nobody interprets what I'm trying to say, they only do what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's too much adjustment after the event. No adjustment. With uh, any of this, or are you just talking about this specific thing? Everything. That we should, that what, what you and I want to happen has got to happen. Not with any, then I think what he means is, it's got to happen exactly okay. as we're saying. Truth. Patience. <laughs> Joy. <laughs> the first time that we shot a scene where Kip, the uh, East Indian sapper, uh, Hannah, uh, the Canadian nurse, Caravaggio, my character, and the English patient are all in the same room. I looked and I said, what kind of story can hold all these characters in the same room if we can make a movie? that does plausibly and with a certain amount of interest, then this is going to be a great movie. Uh... Yeah, come and dance with us. Peter. Oh, come on. It was really a book about a group of people who have to learn how to step out of the war as whole people in some way. Someone like Hannah is someone who's been emotionally damaged. She's not yet ready to kind of step back into the world as a public person. She has to kind of make a new home, a new nest, a new garden, a new, you know, very tentative circle of friends before she can be healed. So they're all sort of healing each other and becoming a, a community among themselves. What, what was all that banging? Were you, were you fighting rats or the entire German army? <laughs> oh, I was repairing the stairs. I found a library. The books were very useful. Before you find too many uses for those books, you might read some to me. I think they're all in Italian, but I'll look, yes. What about your own book? My book? Oh, yes, uh, Herodotus. Yes, you can read him. Oh! I found plums. We have plums in the orchard. There. We have an orchard. Yeah. Herodotus is a father of history. Do you know that? I don't know anything. It's a very plum, plum. 
it, when I was writing it, I, I sort of realized I, I couldn't emphasize it too much because uh, if I was going to spend my time describing the burned face, there would be a gap between yourself and the, between the book and the reader. You know, it's like being unable to look at something and, uh, and, and because you can look at someone's a terrible face, you can become intimate with that person in some way. But it was strange, actually. I found that at first I could talk to him very easily, <laughs> you know, as the patient. You know, it was it was uh, it was easy to talk to him. There was a there was a there was a person there I could, you know, felt quite close to. But uh, no, it, that is something that you know is it, so delicate as a patient that you have to kind of, in a way, stay away. Mm. set in Venice, hundreds of extras brush up on their foxtrot with whatever partner they can find. Beginning at 5 a.m., a dozen makeup artists and hairdressers have period processed them right down to the Marcel waves in their hair. Costumed meticulously from racks of bias cut sequined gowns and double-breasted dinner jackets, they become the international elite of the cosmopolitan world that was 1930s Cairo. How do you need the two songs, near one to the other? Yes, it will be the finish of the one, a drum roll, mm -hmm. and then into where it went. Yeah, all so we will just near. give time for Kristen to leave D'Agostino and run into Almasi and start the next one. Opportunity other than this moment in the film to establish the world of Egypt outside of the desert. We're always in in much more. Uh, uh, there's more privation in the other scenes, and this is the one moment of luxury in the film. So I'm trying to deliver it. Now. Remember, Nina, when you see Wraith, acknowledge him. Okay. It's like everybody's having a dance. There's only one woman, so it's like a, a tag team. You've had your dance, now right. Wraith suddenly turns up, okay? And then off you two go back into the heart of the dancing, because you want to get away from. The thing about here is that at, that at the crane there, basically behind that is your husband, isn't he? He's just over the other side of the window. So, the necessary process is back into this, the safety of the group. You know, back into... Why? Well, so you can talk. You want to ask him about this morning. And also because it's a moment between you. Yeah, but that's not straight away, is it? No. Talk, no, 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 not at all. Away. Not at all. Isn't it just a bit of a shock? Like, oh, yes. Just to be in with him. And then you dance in. And then I think, hey, then, you know, yeah, I can handle this. Exactly. Isn't it? Perfect. No, no, don't have your moment before you start. It should come out of great ease rather than of... It shouldn't be, why did you follow me yesterday? So, no, no. It should, be, it, should, it should be that you start to dance and yeah. then, then when you're relaxed, yeah. then you go into... Okay. Yeah. Can we just try this track once? Yeah. Just to make sure... Good. It's comfortable. Although it's a big kind of epic scene of dance and with all these extras, it's a very intimate love scene as well. It's a love scene yeah. that is a dance scene. It is, it is. And, and that's where it's difficult because, you know, there's a lot of work goes on and it does become background simply to, a, to foreground uh, people. Um, and I think sometimes in some films people get a little bit miffed or upset by that, that, that we didn't just sort of show everything in its splendour. But it all gets cut out because you've got to keep the story rolling along and this is exactly the case. We're going to start wide on the crane and then come in fairly quickly to our couple and then get on with the story in the middle of the dance floor. So in fact, most of this is just background, extraneous sort of people enjoying it, but they have to be there and they have to be dressed correctly, you know? So it's all very sartorial and lovely, really. Yeah. 
Sergio. Play first to take one in camera. Yeah. Okay, here we go and play that. Ta 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 ta. Lovely. That's great for you and Dag. Now, Rafe, delay your entrance. The more you disappear into them, the, the better it is. I know, I know. I just have to... I you have to find your way into... That. Yeah. I just have to... Find your way there. To, ...to direct the dance and be aware of the other people. And then... And that'll, I think that'll only come... With, with practice. practice. Brilliant. I thought that was a wonderful handover that time. Confident, you look wonderful. In you go, drive in. Okay, just just getting confident. That's the way. This is the right shape now, isn't it? Excellent. Okay. Lovely, lovely. You look great, both of you. You look as though you fit in there. I have enough to get through. Like I think what happens in the book, and again, it was something that I it was something I didn't discover until, until I think I was talking to Anthony about. Um, the structure of the book, or the structure of the, the story between Catherine and, um, and Hamazi, and that is when she comes into the story, he's part of the club. You know, that he's there, he's got his best friend, his sidekick, you know, his um, Arab specialist, and all this, and there's a little circle, and she's the outsider. And by the end of their romance, by the time that he's become a kind of the heel or the pariah, and, and uh, there's a sense of he's the one who's outside, and she's part of that. Cairo community. And again, it's, you know, these are things that I, you don't really realize that you're working towards that, but in, that's the thing I like most about that relationship in a way, that they have sort of changed places. And he's you know, kind of seen the world much more nakedly than he was as a club member and as one of the boys. I think he's adept at putting on this uniform, which it is, but I think Amasi is... Um, He's a, he, he's a lover of the desert. I think he loves things that they're most reduced to, that they're most primitive. And I think, well, Catherine accuses him, his behavior of being predatory, and I think he, has a, he is a predator, and I think, I think of him in many ways. I have image of a bird of prey in my head for much of the time, and I think uh, these aren't his real feathers, if you like. What's your energy? The reason why I cast you is because when you met Rave, you got it straight away. You said, oh, what have you been doing then? Oh, Hamlet. Oh. It's like you got him, and he sort of went, oh, it sort of sends him off into a little spin, and that's what she does to him. She, she doesn't buy all this, you know, stuff. She doesn't buy it. She sees there's something much more interesting about him. Are you listening to me? Everything seems right. You know, it's like some of the dialogue in the, in the script is the way I imagine Catherine would talk, or Almasi would talk, because uh, that dialogue wasn't in the book. Why did you follow me yesterday? I I'm sorry, what? After the market, you followed me to the hotel. I was concerned. A woman in that part of Cairo, a European woman, I felt obliged to. You felt obliged to? As the wife of one of our party. So why follow me? Escort me, by all means, but follow me is predatory, isn't it?
Yes, I think he's made himself a bit of an outsider. I mean, I think he he's quite at ease in moving among these kind of people, as Cairo, Cairo said. I imagine he's someone who always wants to get back to the desert, to get out, to get away. She's an English woman, um, very sort of well-connected and well-educated and um, madly in love with her husband who, who comes to the desert and, and has her world turned, up, turned upside down, much to her anger. The journey he goes on in the, in the role, in the, in the story, from being a loner, suddenly having to, and someone who probably doesn't extend himself emotionally much to other people, suddenly finds that, that, that his, that his um, in the presence of Catherine, who's a married woman, that he, he's having to reveal, or, or almost against his wishes, is, expo is exposing another part of himself, emotionally and physically. them into your book. Well, we, uh, we took photographs. Well, there's no need. No, really, I'd like you to have them. Well, there is really no need. This is, um, this is just a scrapbook. I should feel obliged. Thank you. And that would be unconscionable, I suppose, wouldn't it? To feel any obligation. Yes, of course it would. The desert was something, again, where it had become a place where the battles took place, but it meant it was nothing, it was not a historical place for the armies that were there. And I mean, if, if you read about the histories of the desert, I mean, it is this ancient civilization. You know, I mean, you had, you had lakes here, you had, you know, you found harpoons in the desert. I mean, what does that mean? You know, not just talking about, um, you know, Renaissance art, you're talking about something much, much older. So it was that kind of awareness that I, I came to learn. And I, I sort of learned it through the, um, the mindset of the patient, you know. And again, that was something I had to learn as I was writing the book, that uh, I did not know what he stood for when the book began. There was an Almazi who was an uh, explorer in the 30s and uh, who had uh, charted some of the desert. And uh, I stole his name, I guess, and uh, turned him into a fictional character. So uh, most of the story, in fact, is uh, a fiction. There was a kind of um, a basis, a historical basis for him. And that world of the desert in the 30s, before the war broke out, when had, you had various, civilized, uh, various n nations working together, was this kind of idyllic, uh, perhaps idyllic um, state um, that in a way gets replayed a bit at the end with, with the, the four people in the villa, but, um, it, but it did get shattered at the beginning of the war and everyone suddenly became enemies and you know, uh, people who, whose life you had saved suddenly were on the opposite side. Action. Action, go, Jim. Fast as they can, Duncan. When this scene was shot in December, the temperature in the desert was five degrees. Stop, Clive. A camel train helps it to at least look warm, 
reminding us that movies are, after all, only the illusion of reality. And all through now. What we're trying to do, and what we are doing, is not showing the desert as picture, postcards, because that you see every cinematographer can show you postcards, they're all very good. We want it to be a part of their lives that these people are uh, leading and that the audience will get the desert, the beauty of it, which is certainly all over here. Uh, they get it by osmos some kind of osmosis. And you believe these people and then you somehow realize later that where they were and where they are. I came out here to visit the set before anybody else was here. And what absolutely astounded me was the quality of the sound. It's just so thick, you know, it was just every breath, every rustle, every piece of clothing that brushed against it, uh, you could hear everything. And it's, it was incredible the way, I'm a terrible chatterbox and I've been chattering away all the way. 40 minute ride into the desert and to get here and suddenly just sort of you can't you can't speak it's just it seems it seems terrible shame to speak <laughs> because this day however the silence is broken by dozens of tunisian crew members sweeping and blowing the desert landscape to make sure that every grain of sand is in place for the next big stunt <laughs> And if I feel that he's sliding out and we're, we're losing traction on the front wheels so that I can't come round to give you that clean POV without blocking out on the right hand windscreen frame, then I'll call the cut as well. Yeah, that's okay. I think you're not, that's what I'm saying. If you're the camera, you've seen the two boys go and the two vehicles go, then you can move and it doesn't matter if you cross the frame. Yeah, but just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. just remember, though, that this is not the key. Your right. exit not, is not, not the not key not issue. Important. Yeah, okay, good. This scene, a key moment in the plot, left Rafe and Kristen's characters stranded in the sandstorm. On screen, the shot will last no more than seven seconds. It is self-insured for half a million dollars. For a film company that has already had to build a 36-kilometer road into the desert, this is just another expense. Everything will be gone. You won't see anything else here. Any of the stuff that's, that's used as an anchor now, we will pull away before we actually fire it. Daniele. Good? Let's go. Come on. Ten dinar is at stake. But you can't, you can't hold yourself permanently responsible for the money that's being spent because it would be paralyzing. So I think that all I try and tell myself at each day is that there's one day to shoot and these are the things that we have to try and make in the day. It's a very uh, uh, existential process because you can't go back. You're very rarely able to go back and, and reconsider or remake and it doesn't matter how anybody's feeling on that particular day. It says scene 63, you shoot scene 63 and unless the, 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 the weather gods really confound you, you're forced to deal with that scene, irrespective of its emotional tenor, and um, all, all you can do is, is take responsibility in a sort of gestalt way, but not in a, any particular day, in any particular moment. It's here, everybody's here, and you hope that they're as committed as you are and as passionate as, as, as you are about what's happening. Roll cameras! Down speed, tailboard. Speed. 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 And action, Sammy! And cut! Yeah, boy. 
Seven forty three, take one. Sir? How's Paul? Oh, upside down. Mate, well, very, very you. good. You get honorary stuntman status. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well done. Send you the belt buckle. Of course, we don't know if this is going to work because, in the end, there's another kind of reality out there of how, how things will click together, you know, in the end. You can have the best actors and the best taste and the best script, and, and it, it just may not, you know, this is where they have, everyone has to have faith at a certain time, which is exactly the way you are when you're writing. You know, you're writing this book for five years, and you, you've got these little pieces of paper everywhere, and you don't write them in chronological order, and you just think, will this all fit at the end, you know, in the right way? So it's the same kind of uh, uh, the adventure of process, really. And I was struck when, when uh, someone said, well, how do you feel about uh, doing this film? Uh, he said, well, <laughs> I'll always have the book. <laughs> this one is a different kind of story, and I feel sure it'll work. The actors are marvelous. We know we're getting the script, which was written by Anthony, and, and uh, uh, we know we're going to get a good picture, but we still don't know what the public reaction will be. Cause to the Lord. 